Hi, Pat. Hey, John. How are you? <laughs> Pretty good. Can you hear me okay for volume? Yeah, it's very good. Okay. Looks like Eric's connecting to the audio. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. I was I was printing the agenda. <laughs> I'm going to mute myself for a moment here. Okay. Hello, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, hi Justin, very good. Loud and clear. Yeah, I'm good. I'm splitting between my cell phone and uh, you'll probably see me present in the Zoom meeting, but uh, can't use the video, so I'm glad you can hear me well. Yeah, loud and clear. Hi, John. Hi, Joyce. I think Pat's there somewhere. Yeah, Pat just, yeah, she's there. She just stepped away. Is this um, Justin? Yep, Justin. Yep, I'm on. Uh, I'm on my cell phone and online, so um, no okay. video right now. All righty. Eric, are you there? I'm here, yes. Oh, okay. Just checking. There's part of Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Pat <here. laughs> Hi, Pat. Hi, Joyce. My nose was itchy. My mom used to say, if your nose is itchy, you're going to kiss a fool. <laughs> have oh, you ever heard that expression? I sure have. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> <laughs> she had a lot of funny ones, boy. I guess it was the times that which she was raised, you know? Yep, that's for sure. He was born in 1920 and, of course, lived to be 94 years of age, so <laughs> saw a lot of things. I had a mom born in the same era and lived mm -hmm. to be 97. Mm -hmm.
Kim will not be with us today. Um, she is in another meeting. Well, we've got three of us. We don't have a quorum. So we'll uh, wait a few more minutes to see what's going to happen. Yeah, sorry. I dropped out. I'm back on my cell phone, but I think I lost internet at the house. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> I understand that. Such a beautiful outside day today. I it's didn't spend gorgeous much outside, but it was lovely. I, I had my lunch out on the porch. It was so so beautiful. Sarah Linda, are you on? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Uh, Edith, you're on too? I'm here. Okay. Yes. We have a quorum, so we can start. The uh, Town of Canandaigua Environmental Conservation Board is now in session. Um, first item on the agenda uh, just to let you all know, uh, Kim will not be with us today. Uh, what is, oh, are we saying the French to that? That's nice. <laughs> did you do that, Eric, or did you do that, John? Oh, I did that. <laughs> is this a legal uh, uh, a pledge of allegiance that we can do? <laughs> I suppose, I don't know. So we've been doing for the planning and zoning boards. Do they, do they actually say the pledge to that? Yeah. They do. All right. Well, let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the and republic, to republic for which it stands, stands one nation under God, God visible, visible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. Okay. <laughs> See, there isn't anything you can't do on Zoom, practically. 
All right. Uh, approval of the minutes. As far as I know, we don't have any guests. I can't uh, see any on my screen anyway, if we do. Um, all right. Any, um, any comments regarding our uh, last month's meetings? That was the July 2nd um, minutes. All right, I'll move to approve the minutes of July 2nd. Second. Second. Second, all right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All I need is four, go ahead, a couple more. Aye. <laughs> all Aye. right, thank Aye. you. Okay, uh, since we have nobody um, visiting, you're on, uh, Eric, report from the development office. Sure. Um, so on Tuesday, as you know, Joyce, the comprehensive plan project team reconvened after a long absence. Um, we worked through the last remaining goals. So there was 11 total goals. We did goals, say, I think five of them, Hamlets, transportation, infrastructure, government operations, and tourism. And we set out some uh, measurables and some action items for that. Uh, the next step for us is kind of compiling a complete draft. Um, and then, you know, we're probably going to keep soliciting some comments to see if anybody else has any other action items between different boards, committees, department heads uh, to add in there. Uh, not to mention the whole editorial element of it. Um, let's see. The there are two studies going on which will have meetings coming up. There's a Middle Cheshire Road Corridor study that on August 19th we'll have a meeting at um, Crosswinds Church on Middle Cheshire Road. Um, there should be a flyer going around, and if uh, you guys want one, I will obviously get it to you. Um, Sarah may also be sending it out to all the boards and committees in the near future. There is the study on 332 and 96, uh, there is a kind of walking tour along 332. This, the yeah. event, this workshop generally takes place in the town of Farmington, but the study area covers a bit in the town of Canandaigua. But that one will be meeting on September 1st. That'll be 5.30, I believe, or 6 o'clock. Um, we'll get to the ordinance stuff in a little bit. But as for previous properties or previous applications, uh, the Kieran application on North Menteith uh, was approved conditionally. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, so there, there was a lot of discussion about that one, especially about like the septic and everything. Um, but they did end up conditionally approving it. Uh, the Hess application also was conditionally approved. They, they didn't seem to have as many concerns about that one. Really? Um, <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it related to like the shoreline guidelines, the concerns they did have. Mm. Uh, yeah. Again, they, they had to provide to the pool. Yeah. Can, can you tell us what the conditions were just briefly? Let me try to grab them real quick. So these are the Hess ones. And they have the standard conditions about plans being signed, uh, surety, addressing the town engineer's comment letter, highway and water comment letter, site development building permit application, which they've already done. Uh, prior to C of O, watershed inspector approving the on-site wastewater treatment. Um, what was I thinking? The, Tyler Rowley didn't have a ton of comment on this one. 
just because they're maintaining the same one. I think what he said is he just wants to make sure that all the fixtures and architectural details are right. Um, CFO, DPW, there's minimal work going on in the right of way, and then the uh, phosphorus notes. Do you have any questions on that? No. No. Uh, the Kieran site plan. So again, uh, signatures, uh, lot line adjustment plans to be done, surety provided. Uh, addressing the town engineer's comment letter, site development building permit application. Uh, prior to plan signatures being fixed on the plan, site plans will be revised to depict the approved location of the on-site wastewater treatment system and an approval from the watershed inspector, DOH, regarding their review uh, of the system provided in the town. So essentially, that has to be designed, reviewed, and approved prior to signatures being placed on the plans. So where generally, and how they've operated in the past, is that um, they can get permits and plan signed, but they won't get a CFO until an approval is granted. On this one, uh, largely because of Tyler Rowley's comment letter, uh, they made the condition a little bit more stronger. Uh, payment of fee, so just because you got to pay park and rec fee, variances on the plans, uh, provide the correct dimensions. That just relates to them removing the patio area that falls within the 25-foot uh, setback from the lake, and then the standard phosphorus notes. Are there any questions on that one? So does that mean they eliminated the patio that was within 25 feet of the lake? Correct. Okay, so that must have happened after we reviewed it, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, and, and if I'm remembering correctly, the another aspect of our recommendation was we asked if we could review the project again after the details of the septic system were, were uh, firmed up. Um, that didn't happen? As a condition, anyway. No. Yeah. Condition. Um, hold on. I trust that's kind of, um, when. So when that comes in, obviously we can give it to you guys to review. That's not a problem. We don't have it yet. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Okay. Um, back to our agenda. Um, well, I already gave you guys a comment update. Yeah. Okay. We'll uh, get to the other refer. We'll get to the referrals from the ordinance committee after we review our referrals from the citizen implementation committee, uh, which was the draft natural resource inventory, um, uh, now dated July 2020, and basically, you know, I just sent out a an email that everybody just kind of review it. There is that overview that we saw uh, that was about a half an hour that was a presentation to the um, CIC and it just gave you a very good just to you know get us back into the thoughts of what in the heck the natural resource inventory uh, was all about and we hadn't seen it for a while and um, we hadn't seen it since uh, since last year actually. So um, okay so basically, I'm just assuming that you've all taken a look at that, that uh, short uh, instructional presentation that LaBella gave to the CIC. And so, um, and that refreshing your memory uh, regarding uh, what particularly the, the ECB may, uh, is going to be doing with this NRI. And so um, I don't think we, the, the process, the sequence of events here is that it's going to be reviewed by the town by all by the boards the uh, planning board the zba of course right now we're reviewing some of its uh, details and uh then it will go and some of the other boards or committees as as 
been seen fit. Once we get feedback, once Labella gets feedback from that, it's going to then go the C, uh, back to the CIC and the CIC is gonna send it to the town board. So we can expect probably sometime, maybe September if we're lucky, if we get all the comments back from the boards and uh, it's sent to the town board, the CIC reviews, it goes back to the town board and then we'll get the approvals. So when the approvals come in, that is when there's going to be a formal training uh, by Labella for all the boards uh, regarding how the boards will interact with the new natural resource inventory update. So that's basically where we're going with this. Now I have reviewed the, 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 the document, made a lot of comments myself, and I won't go into them today. Because they're basically a lot of you know, kind of structural kind of things, things that were kind of left out, a map that was in the wrong place, that kind of thing. But if you have any uh, comments that you have seen as you reviewed it, you can either um, send it directly to Labello or you can send it to me and I can forward to Barb all of the comments that the ECB would have. So is there anybody who would be interested in, has read the document and has comments to make? You can forward those to me. You can make a note of them now if you'd like, uh, and then I can send them on to Barb. Is there anybody who was actually interested in doing that? Okay, then I'll send my remarks on. If you have anything that you want to remark on it, that's fine, then we can do that. Basically though, I just wanna mention a couple of things and I'm just looking at page one of the introduction here. And um, it's going, to, it's providing a good overview again of, of what um, we're going to be doing with this. Uh, especially in in regards to the project review guide and the assessment form that is now uh, going to be part of what the ECB, how the ECB is going to be reviewing and how the planning board would be reviewing um, applications in regard to protection of natural resources. What I'd like to draw your attention to really on just page one here is the use of the NRI in project review and just go down a little ways and take a look at the second paragraph. Um, and it talks about priorities for updates there. At the very last part of that sentence, it says priorities for updates. And um, we will have some responsibilities. The, the uh, ECB will have responsibilities for any of the recommended, uh, that, uh, uh, recommended uh, priorities goals, strategies, or whatever, once this is this document is approved by the town board. So I'm thinking along the lines of our project plan for 2021 and how we could possibly utilize this document to include uh, those responsibilities uh, for the ECB to the NRI and how we can move forward. And um, the first one is the update of the land cover mapping. Our land cover mapping was uh, last um, provided in 2002 by Bruce Gilman. And so it's going to take um, some uh, more uh, cooperation with Bruce because he's still doing some things for the county, even though he's not at FLCC now. So we could possibly on our projects plan, we could um, develop some kind of relationship with uh, Bruce and see how he is, see if he's willing to do something like that. And if he is kind of formulate a plan for that or cost or whatever. And um, so that's one of the things that we could do on a, our uh, project plan for 2021. And the other one is the next one, investigate wildlife corridors. Additional field level, ma level mapping is needed to identify critical habitats and corridors for wildlife. Well, you know that Mike Palermo uh, was one of the presenters when we did the, um, the forest uh, 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 program that we did last year. So this is maybe we could partner with him, with the DEC and see if they'd be willing to do uh, some kind of field mapping uh, uh, regarding our critical habitat. So that's really kind of a big hole that we have in our, uh, our documented processes. We don't know what we have out there in wildlife and it might be good for us to know um, where, the, where uh, wildlife habitat is actually 
being is critical is being either jeopardized or enhanced. So those are two of the things. Um, and uh, that's about that's about it for what I had to say about this. Um, if there's any other questions regarding this, we can cert we'll certainly be talking about them after it goes yep. to the time. Joyce. Yep. Go ahead. Joyce, can I, can I, how oh great, it's saying my internet connection is unstable. If you want information about abandoned wells, the watershed inspector would be a good source for that because that is on the assessment documents they have for keeping records. So talk to, uh, talk to the watershed inspector at uh, the Soil and Water District. They may have a great deal more information about that than anybody else. Okay, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, uh, the other one that we could do something about, all those four issues there, we're probably gonna have to deal at one time or another. Um, I'm thinking that the update of the scenic views is probably um, that prioritization. I think that you, Edith and Sarah Linda were on that committee when that prioritization was, so we'll have to talk about if we actually, how, if we're going to do it or if and someone else is going to do it and what, how the cost or, you know, how that's kind of a discussion we'll have to have with Doug and the planning um, department about how we might go about that and get that done. So all four of those are basically things that we'll be involved in one way or the other. Yeah. Okay, any, any other uh, comments regarding this? Okay, let's go on to our next item. And I believe that's, Eric, you're on again. We are looking at now going to be from the ordinance committee referrals from the ordinance committee for off street parking regulations. I apologize, I had muted myself. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, let's see, so off street parking. Um, briefly go through the justification. Um, essentially, too much parking is a bad thing, is what it, this comes down to, and I'm sure that that's not news to anybody here. Um, it's a severe economic cost to people, uh, generally um, larger commercial development, single family homes less so, but for uh, the example I put in here for TOPS, uh, it became a requirement for almost a few acres of parking uh, that they put in. So uh, parking is relatively expensive on the low end, I think it's about like $4,000 of space or something like that. So this can be a oh. tremendous economic burden. Uh, the same thing was felt in uh, Roseland Plaza and some of the other research that I had that even even though we cut their required parking in half when it was approved, you all know that that parking lot is vacant uh, pretty much entirely year round and there's probably an excess of parking there. Um, our parking requirements have not changed in 30 years at least. Um, so we're still, we haven't really updated them for the times, which generally has reduced the amount of parking requirement and provided a larger variety of standards to say, you know, it's not just doctors, but it might break out uh, different types of doctors or chiropractors, whatever the case may be. Uh, there's the environmental effects of uh, more parking, uh, potentially greater salt, uh, higher stormwater requirements, so bigger ponds. Uh, heat island effects, uh, all that good stuff. Uh, then there's the economic problem of inducing people to drive, so you end up burning more carbon. Um, it's expensive to maintain. Uh, it helps promote the type of development that the town has stated that the, it wants to provide, uh, so multimodal development and mixed use type stuff, especially in the MUO areas. Um, essentially parking is, or excessive parking is bad. And so uh, this local law is 
done with the effect of allowing uh, developers and the planning board to identify the appropriate amount of parking for their developments um, instead of pres prescribing what those standards are at the beginning without any knowledge of what exactly is being proposed. Um, I'll try to avoid going through this entire thing, um, but we've changed the definition so it doesn't include this the size of the space, although there's another section that will relate to that. Um, skip that one for now. Skip that. So the main requirements here are how it's changed. Uh, there's some dimensional standards in the site design criteria, and there's mm -hmm. uh, more of them. So before it was a 10 by 20 minimum 200 square foot space. Now I think it's like a minimum 8.6, or this is proposing 8. Eight and a half feet by 18 or something to that effect. Um, there was a maximum on the amount of handicapped parking spaces. We've eliminated that maximum requirement, um, and now our standards are relatively higher than uh, the ADA requirements. Um, we are allowing more uh, shared parking spaces and also. Um, parking or off-site parking. So generally in, in a more suburban area, you're not going to see that, but in like what they envision the uptown area to be, um, having off-site parking allows a more efficient allocation of parking so that, and then this requirement says it's got to be within uh, 1,300 feet, which is a healthy five-minute walk at, I think it's like 250 feet per minute. Um, mm -hmm. so, Five minutes is not overly burdensome. Generally, you're not going to see that. Obviously, businesses still want, still have the incentive to have parking closer, but in the event that land costs are very high, there's high demand, it's a, a growing area like we want Uptown to be, that again allows them to more efficiently use parking spaces. Um, joint use. Um, so as far as how the demand will be based uh, using the ITE standards or other acceptable standards to do that and and that would be provided to the planning board for their review and approval. Um, there's a threshold as to when that would be required. Uh, new construction in excess of 500 or 5,000 square feet, a renovation of 50,000 square feet um, or upon request of the planning board during the course of the review. Oh, uh, Eric? Yes. I did notice on page 10 under applicability on uh, letter A, you have the, the wrong kind of principal building there. <laughs> okay. Okay. Both, uh, if you notice under B, it is correct. It's principal. <laughs> you might want to catch, catch that in the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, uh, grammar police strike. <laughs> no. It's all important, Edith, all of it. Well, it is. It just it is. Yeah, I agree with that. I didn't catch it. Um, yeah. So that is generally at this waiver for current construction. I, I hope that that language is clear. And currently what they do is they land bank some parking spots to where it's included in like seeker approvals. but not required to be constructed. That's just trying to codify that, where mm -hmm. right now it's kind of just a practice. Um, and then here's the new potential site design requirements. Uh, this would allow them to create smaller parking lots partly, um, and then also parking spaces. So before you needed 200 square feet and 100 square feet behind each space or around each space to maneuver. This potentially minimizes that depending on the configuration they want to go with. Okay, any comments from the board regarding um, the proposed draft of the parking regulations? So parking lots ever go away? You mentioned all these unused spaces. Is there any incentive to convert parking lots into green space? Um, yeah, I mean, so right now they have to maintain them, both uh, plowing, resurfacing, 
Um, so there is an ongoing cost. Um, turning it back to grass, uh, obviously there's a, the initial upfront cost of pulling it up and putting in like topsoil or something like that, that might limit the willingness of some people to do that. Uh, however, it might be more likely in some of these areas where you have an excess of parking to actually redevelop those spaces into um, commercial property that's maybe more valuable to the town, to that developer, to people that use that, whatever service that might be. Sure. Um, sure. And maybe during development, some of it would become green again as well. Yeah. Good. Uh, and, the, and the first page, there's some reference to paving of uh, passageways and driveways, except going to homes. Uh, when I'm out riding my bike, I, I'll pass you know, some of these seasonal farm markets that pop up during the summer that I think all have gravel driveways. Those would not be required uh, to have a paved surface, I, I presume. No. So it's like on the first page, uh, 174-22B. Yeah, I, uh, I don't think so. I mean, one, this relates to the subdivision requirements of town code. So okay. only when somebody is going through a subdivision might this apply. I see. I see. If somebody was putting up a temporary farm stand or something to that effect, yeah. it wouldn't be in like the zoning code. Okay. I don't believe there's something similar there. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Well, it's it's just a good thing that, that the town is looking at its uh, parking allocations now because it has been and has been for a very long time, many years, um, really over, uh, you know, we've, we've gone overboard for the car. And as we move into multimodal, I think that that will not have the same uh, emphasis that it had, you know, 10, 20 years ago, so. Thank the Ordinance Committee for looking at that. Anybody else has any comments? I think it's a good thing, if, if any, that's all. <laughs> Those are my comments. To reduce the parking whenever possible. And this is going in that direction. Okay, let's move on to the next referral, which is the Manufactured Housing Standards. So this, this change came up, uh, well, if you guys look at this, you'll see Chris's email from February. This is kind of where it came from. Um, Tim King, who is a manufactured home builder, filed a complaint that uh, we weren't following HUD standards or we were more restrictive than HUD standards, which is uh, generally not allowed, essentially because they HUD's goal is to provide affordable housing. Um, and so we can't provide like more foundation requirements, but we can have aesthetic requirements. Um, and so mm -hmm. the code, which currently was a like construction requirement is now proposed to be um, a aesthetic or, or more, more clearly an aesthetic requirement. So it just provides that skirting should be or is required around manufactured homes placed in the town. Any comments from the board? Can you, um, can you clarify this? You're, you're saying that it's not permitted to have plastic or metal um, uh, sheathing material as the skirt under a manufactured home and it has to be a masonry material? Is, it, is that what Is, is that the standard? Uh, I suppose it could be wood of some kind as well. Um, it doesn't necessarily say what it has to be, but that it can't be plastic or metal. Um, but the foundation walls, if they are placed as concrete is for aesthetic purposes. But, but you only refer to concrete as the aesthetic solution. So it kind of leaves other materials up in the air. Yeah. Um, 
want to get, would it make sense to remove the reference to concrete or concrete block? I mean, what about something like hardy board, for instance? I guess at a more basic level, where does the aesthetic standard come from? Is that based on anything that determines the concrete or whatever material it is? I mean, the, I guess the aesthetic that standard just, at this point has been, or is a suggestion of the ordinance committee at the point when it's adopted by the town board, it would be their aesthetic standard. Um, but I don't know that there's like an objective thing that I can say that this is drawn from. Okay. Uh, but Sarah Linda, that's a good question. I had a I question. Yeah, go ahead, Joyce. Question about um, where does the small, tiny home come into our code? Would it come in as a what? As in a manufactured home, or because in a sense, you know, those homes can be um, they can be you know portable. You can drive them around or is so, but the other thing is, is that a lot of um, tiny homes now are having like, um, they're being made out of shipping, um, you know, those shipping containers and other kinds of, you know, pre-used uh, structures um, that they're making into tiny homes. So, and they're about, you know, they can be anywhere from 200, 300 to 700, you know, the tiny ones, um, below that 700 square foot living area that that talks about in this code. So would that kind of a structure be considered a manufactured house and come under these um, standards? Uh, I guess partly it would. Um, tiny homes, so that, and I, I pulled this up because Chris and I have had conversations about this. I think t tiny homes, um, granny pods, whatever you call them, are a good idea and I think the town should work towards it. It's something that we've talked about and hopefully we'll get the ordinance committee to work on soon. Um, they, my understanding after my conversations with Chris is that they likely wouldn't meet uh, energy code if they were like stick built in place. Um, but if they are manufactured by like a certified manufactured home provider, you know, and it, they are governed by HUD at that point, then yes, they would fall under um, these manufactured home requirements. Um, the issue there is that we have this requirement that, you know, all single family dwelling units, um, yeah shall offer no less than 1,100 square feet. Right. Uh, so we prohibit small homes, essentially, in whatever form. And there's so much emphasis now on these small homes with, you know, with younger people. I know my, my grandson, he's 24, he wants to build one. And I said, uh-oh. <laughs> well, you're going to have to look at the code, the town code, and see if you actually can. And what? And, and so I'm thinking he's going to have some trouble here getting a permit in order to build anything. Um, so do we? are we going to be having uh, maybe a code that will look specifically at tiny homes? Because if it's been man manufactured by someone else and not built by the, you know, by the individual who's going to live in it, that seems a little arbitrary to me. Uh, why can't people, then the fact is that most of these people who like tiny homes, they want to build their own tiny home. Um, yeah. So a part of it relates to like energy code requirements is what Chris said, like. Um, well, it's not I'm attached not sure exactly. or anything. I mean, it's a standalone. Well, kind of. it's something like all dwelling uh -huh. units in New York State, especially new dwelling units, have to meet the energy code requirements, which are pretty strict these days. 
So it, it's just difficult, if not impossible, to do that in a home with whatever, 400 square feet, not to mention all the egress required and the various other health and safety fire code rules um, to where it would have to be done. I don't know. Well, I guess the bypass is if it's called a camper, right? Um, I guess well, that's the other, other use or other you're, definition you're that's used by many homers. You're not technically supposed to live in a camper uh, outside of, let's say, like in the, in the town of Canandaigua, a campground, so like a where it's actually permitted to do that. And in, in the town of Canandaigua, you need a special use permit to have a campground. Um, I think partly that relates to the requirements of um, having like a on-site wastewater. That's my understanding, again, from conversations with Chris Jensen. But we don't allow people to just live in their camper in the town, at least knowingly. Have your grandson build a yurt. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, Sarah, Linda, you had a comment? Yeah, I, I'm not clear on what there is about the energy code that would preclude you from making a energy efficient tiny home. I mean, just because it's under 400 square feet, why can't you, why can't you meet the energy code? Yeah, I'm not sure. It's a better question for Chris Jensen. I think okay. he maybe was saying it's just particularly or prohibitively difficult to, not that it's impossible. Okay, well, I think one of our recommendations back to the ordinance committee is to take a look at tiny homes. And uh, I know right now with this, there's a lot of, especially in my grandson's uh, circle, they're coming back to Canandaigua I know of five of them that have, and um, they're looking to, you know, do their own thing now. Uh, you know, we're looking at property, we're, we're, and the, the intention is to, maybe I'm going to build my own place. Whether that happens or not, I don't know, but we're, it certainly would be a predicament for um, someone who wants to build a tiny house to come to our town today and to have kind of confusing um, information regarding how that's going to happen. So anyway, just a FYI to the to the town to the ordinance committee that maybe tiny houses needs to have it, some kind of a recognition or code constructed or more clarity I guess is what we to that point, Joyce, mm -hmm. the uh, the CIC is going to have a conversation on like affordable housing. Mm -hmm. uh, this I think is appropriate within that certainly. Okay. The elimination of this or modification of this 1100 square foot rule yeah uh, exactly I there's a lot of areas in the code that like you mentioned prohibit uses like this that people want to do that seem to make sense whether it's you know your your children moving back in the area or maybe your uh, adult parents you know living with or whatever you know it makes sense uh, but our code prohibits it Okay, sounds like a future uh, uh, talk, a debate. <laughs> okay, let's move right along then to uh, our planning, our own planning uh, review committee referrals. CPN twenty zero forty five. All right, I'm just pulling it up right now. Um, so this house sits at the corner of uh, Wifels Road and West Lake. Um, the existing house and garage are kind of outlined right here. They are proposing a two-story addition and associated other elements, gravel driveway, patio, um, in the rear yard, essentially. Uh, there's, not, there's not a ton of changes shown on the plan. The architecture elevations are here. Um, Is there, I guess, 
that point, I'll turn it over to you. I know we, Sarah Linda, you provided comments here as well, uh, and also some photos. Um, so, can I answer any questions for you guys? Okay, Sarah Linda, do you want to take us through the comments section that you forwarded? Sure. Um, let's see. Okay, the, the um, project involves putting a second floor addition on top of the existing garage and also extending it to the rear, um, that, along with some op both open and, and um, covered patios. The, the house is, a, is historically significant, certainly. Um, it was the former Wolverton Farm. Uh, Wolverton is also the name associated with the cemetery, which is on the other side of, um, of Weifels Road. Uh, so this was the farmhouse for a, quite a large farm that covered, you know, a good stretch of, of Westlake Road in this part of the town. Um, and the main house, which is the part closest to um, uh, Westlake Road, is quite well preserved. Um, if, if any of you went on the 2011 Historical Society's tour of homes, this was one of the homes that was featured. And um, it's, it, it was built in 1883, I believe, no, 73. Um, and it has been nicely maintained and also added to uh, a number of times over the years. So this would be one more in a whole series of additions. Um, the, the addition uh, um, uh, appears to be visually, um, what do I want to say, fairly inconspicuous, even though it's kind of large. Um, it's still set back from the main part of the house and it is only marginally visible from uh, Westlake Road and it's really not visible at all from middle, uh, from Weifels Road, uh, mainly because of a, of a um, tall arborvitae hedge that they've got along the entire property. So you're really not going to see it at all from uh, the north side. And um, my only comment on it from the, an architectural point of view, and I'm not sure that this really has any bearing on the environmental review, but um, if, if the town is, is um, evaluating additions to historic sites and they want to ensure that the thing is uh, visually um, compatible, my suggestion would be to ask that the, on the elevation drawings, they include the existing building as well. Because right now the elevation drawings, there are complete elevation drawings, but they don't uh, give you any information about how this is going to fit in with the, with the, uh, the original uh, property. And the style is not exactly the same, but I don't think there's any problem with that. Um, but it is a two-story addition to a two-story house. So it would be nice to know how the heights compare and if this building is in fact gonna be higher the bridge line is going to be higher than um, the adjacent building that it's attaching to. Maybe you know that, Eric. I don't. I don't know the answer. I know there was a variance granted, probably for a, a past addition, um, to allow 27 feet rather than 25 mm -hmm. feet. So I don't know what that means. What they're saying, anyways, is that it's going to be essentially the same height as what's there today. The same height as the existing building. Okay, so that's that's, that's good. good. Yeah. Okay. Any other environmental concerns or concerns at all about anything? I understand that um, the shoreline guidelines uh, may come into play here um, because the whole property. Am I am I right about that, um, Eric? The whole property is being considered, including the lakefront, and if so. The, the shoreline guidelines is missing, um, but I'm not sure whether you decided or somebody decided that that's actually appropriate or not. Was that part of the... Um, uh, you know, it wasn't... Oh, actually, no, it wasn't part of the PRC, I mean, proposed landscaping statement. Uh, I will... Oh, yeah, there it is. Statement of compliance. It was there. So, okay. 
that that was my only um, question regarding that. And uh, as far as our recommendations, no comments. Anybody else have anything? Okay, that's our comments. All right, moving on to um, 20047 on Neff Road. Waiver from, whoops, sorry. Okay, now, uh, right. yeah, go ahead. So this is all one parcel today. Uh, this is on Knapp Road, uh, the south side of Knapp Road. Um, this, I believe, is about 50 acres today, and they want to subdivide it into, uh, this one will be about 11 acres on the east, uh, 27 acres in the middle, and another 11-acre parcel on the west side, or excuse me, reverse that. 11 acres on the west, 27 and 11 acres on the east. Um, there is a, a water course that runs through it, essentially like this. They have it noted right there, approximate center line. Um, surrounding that water course is a lot of uh, steep slopes, so uh, 14 or so acres in the steep slope area. You noticed and had it up there for a second, the waiver request. Uh, two waivers that they're requesting here. One, uh, I don't if I have it on my ZLB. Yeah. Residential lots greater than three acres uh, shall not have depths greater than two and a half times the proposed width. Um, these are, of course, very long parcels. They do not meet that, these two on the outside. The one in the middle does. Um, so they're requesting a waiver from that requirement in the subdivision section. And then uh, parcels containing, or pair parcels that contain greater than 10% of the natural resources shall be subject to the conservation subdivision process. Um, this, there is 14 acres of steep slope on it. Um, out of 50 acres, it's over 10%. So therefore it should uh, go to the conservation subdivision process. They're requesting a waiver from that, um, essentially because it's not a conservation subdivision, and also because it, uh, because of the arrangement of the lots, it's essentially to remain wild. Can't re-subdivide any of these, and you can only have one house on it. There's no plans or ability to develop it to the extent that a conservation subdivision generally is. So, with that in mind. Okay, Sarah Linda, got some comments here. Okay, well, my comments are kind of repeat what uh, Eric said, 50 acres, about a little over a thousand feet of road frontage, uh, three lots. There are buildings on all three. There, there's a house, barn, and, uh, but, and pond on the center one. Uh, the other two have what I guess you'd call accessory structures. There's a little shed on the eastern one, and there's a little cabin on the western one. Uh, um, I'm assuming that, well, the subdivision lines have been positioned in such a way that um, even if the, these had to be, well, well, if, if they, these east and west lots were developed, and these were treated as accessory structures, um, they would not need a variance. They're, they have enough, they're, they're set back enough from the property line that they um, meet the setback requirements. Um, the land is rated as, uh, the land, for, land cover is successional northern hardwood forest. Um, if you take a look at Encore or um, uh, Google Maps or anything, you can see the extent of the forest. It's, a, it's part of the strategic forest protection area. It's pretty densely um, uh, wooded here. Mm -hmm. This Encore map is a little bit misleading because the, the, the brown 
stuff um, that doesn't look like woods is in fact woods. And the green stuff I think is conifer woods. So this is a photo that was taken in the winter. And uh, what is brown on that, on that map is just um, trees that are not showing because they don't have any leaves on them. But it is all, all forest. Um, and the stream that goes across it is a class C stream. Um, it's in a pretty high part of the town, not the absolutely highest, but see there, if you zoom out, you can see that this, this wooded part of town goes all the way through from um, uh, Route 64 in Bristol, um, all the way over to Route 21. So Knapp Road, Smith Road, Jones Road, this is all among the most wooded parts of the town. Um, and it being a 50 acre parcel, this one rates ranks fairly high in the ranking system that was established in the open space plan. Um, it is, oh wait a minute, this number is wrong. It, it's um, in the middle category on that open space ranking map um, with one to five. This is part of number three. And if you line up all of the parcels, there are, uh, the, the number on my draft here is wrong. It's not 15,800. It must be mm -hmm. 1,587 parcels that were ranked. And this one is number 73 from the, from the top. So it's, um, you know, a significant parcel from a, from a um, conservation point of view. Yeah, there it is. Um, it, the, the dark blue and the medium blue are the highest two. And this is a dark green, which is in the, the middle category. But um, Eric, maybe you could point out on this where the parcel is. Um, it's right down here. It's up a little higher. Oh, no, yeah, you're right. That, that, that's it. Um, so it's actually an area that already, th this is the largest parcel together with the one that is to the east of it that goes down all the way to, what would that be? Um, Ketchum Road? This would be Smith. Smith Road, yeah. Um, so there's already been a certain amount of subdivision there of forested parcels into, into smaller, um, um, uh, smaller land pieces. Um, Environmental concerns. Um, one of the greatest threats to the forest lands is fragmentation in which large wooded parcels are subdivided and subsequently cleared or developed um, and, and developed or farmed. Um, in this case, I, I, I gathered just from a quick look at the waiver form there, the intent of the owner is to create a couple of parcels that he could pass along to his children uh, possibly for future development as house sites. Um, yeah, they, uh, as long as that is what happens and the houses are built relatively close to the road, I don't think there's any major problem with that. Um, um, obviously, if, the, if, if a new owner took this and decided to log the whole thing or clear it or farm it or something like that, then you'd have the potential for a significant loss of farmland in a, in, in a place which is already pretty dense with farmland. Um, so I would say fragmentation is kind of a theoretical threat here, um, but doesn't seem to be an immediate threat. Um, and I would, I would think that this would be a great opportunity for the conservation easement team, which has been formed and which has the, the charge of trying to persuade people to do conservation easements. Uh, this might be a great test case to go to the owner and say, hey, what, what would you think of putting a conservation easement on this before you subdivide it, just to make sure that it stays woods? Um, maybe he won't go for it, but it'd be a nice exercise for the conservation easement people to uh, perfect their pitch. Agreed. And uh, especially since they're asking for a waiver from the conservation subdivision design, um, that that would be a, a nice remedy uh, for that to put a conservation easement on, uh, you know, the, the all the wooded property across all three 
of, of, of the subdivision. And the other fit possibility would be is that they could actually um, just subdivide less on each side. It's an RR3 actually um, zoning district. Um, they don't need to have those long narrow lots if they just subdivide into smaller lots and then put the rest of that into a conservation easement along along the bottom. So there's some opportunities I think here for some um, you know for some conversation um, as they are asking for the waiver and how we can you know how important it would be to um, to conserve that land. So the recommendation? Uh, ECB recommends the conservation easement team be asked to contact the property owner about the idea of placing an easement on these three parcels prior to, well, not sale, prior to transfer. Or prior to subdivision, let's say. Yeah. Does it, anybody else have any comments regarding this, this application? Edith, do you see anything that we need to? No, I don't see anything. I think you've covered it nicely. <laughs> and it is a great opportunity for a conservation easement and an important yeah. place to try to get one. Right. Uh, Gary, since you live in the area, you might be a neighbor. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts? Anything else? Do you want to add? Have, yeah, nothing else. I mean, what's been said. So just. Uh, I hate to ask questions here, it's something you folks all know the answers to, but for the conservation easement, the, uh, the incentive, the advantages for the owners would be, would be what? What do they get? I understand the, the value of doing it, but what is it, how do they incentivize it? That is what the conservation easement team is actually going to be working on. There's, there are incentives right now. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on a number of factors, but uh, the assessment value does not necessarily go down as it goes down a little bit, but that's not like an incentive. So the incentive really is kind of a personal thing that you're going to be able to preserve this since he's, they're preserving this for their family. It, it appears anyway. Um, it seems as though that might be, you know, some an altruistic thing that they would like to do with this property. Sounds like they. What's that? One, one would hope. Thanks for that explanation. Yeah. Um, the conservation easement team has quite a an agenda um, when it comes to this subject. So we'll see how they they have not been meeting during the COVID, and I don't know when they're getting back together. But it certainly is, I think, an important aspect of how we view um, our town and how and the preservation of natural resources. So hopefully they'll get together soon and can start working on some of those issues. Well, if we present them with a, a low hanging fruit. <laughs> so yeah, this, right. This will That's spur true. them to get back together, yes. Yep. yep. John, could you make sure that the conservation easement team um, gets a copy of our recommendation regarding this so that they know what is happening in the town. You know, there might not, I don't know who's on the conservation easement team. Um, I think, well, Chuck Euler is, I think, maybe, maybe not. I'm not quite so sure who is, but may not be aware that, you know, that the planning board, that the environmental conservation board is actually suggesting this kind of thing when it, when it, when we come to our site review. Okay, last one here is uh, CPN 2049. Um, so this property is along the uh, southern end of Middle Cheshire Road. Uh, there has been for a number of years a lot of flag lots. It's kind of this group over here. Uh, I think it was subdivided back in like 85 or so. Um, mostly they're subdivided like this so that they can have nice views out towards the lake. There's generally a view shed protection area. They each have a deed restriction protecting the views down the lake. Uh, this parcel is right here. 
there is a view protection area, I believe, uh, like right in this area. Um, he wants to build the house right here, which is fine. Uh, and that's pretty much it. New single family dwelling, septic area right here, which is kind of where that view protection area is. Um, pool, new house. The existing tree line is right here. They're proposing to cut it back just a little bit to right there. Um, well, a little bit is, as the owner said in the PRC, it's about a hundred trees is what he's actually saying will probably come down. So I have a little issue with that, but okay, go ahead. That's it. That, that's it. Okay, Sarah Linda, summary of key points and comments. Okay, uh, the existing parcel is 4.7 acres and the proposal doesn't need any variances. It's all uh, to standard. Um, it's a combination of open land and woods. Um, and it's the, the new house is at the edge of the woods. There, this is a larger woods. And if, Eric, could we take a look at the Encore map um, just to see what the surroundings are? Um, yeah, you can see this woods. Um, this is one corner of a woods that covers also another um, four properties, uh, two of which are on the lake side of the woods, so those have views of the lake. Um, one of them is across the driveway to the south of the proposed one, and um, um, so the whole woods is, I'm guessing, something like uh, I don't know if this if this parcel is five acres, probably the woods is somewhere between uh, five and ten acres, maybe eight acres or so. And it is um, doesn't really connect with any other wooded areas. So it's hard to say whether it's um, uh, how, how significant it is for as a wildlife corridor. But it's big enough that it probably okay, 10 acres, it's big enough that it probably supports a fair amount of wildlife on its own. Um, so you would not want to encroach on that wooded area any more than you have to. Um, and the woods is also on the ridge line. Um, so the houses that can see the lake, you also can see from the house. Uh, but this new house is going to be beyond the woods, so it, I don't think it really has a, an impact on um, a view shed. These, as far as I could see, although each of these flag lots has their own little strip of land going out to Middle Cheshire Road, in fact, several of them actually share a single driveway. And this one is going to share the driveway that also serves two other ones. So that's all to the good, as far as I can see. It means we don't have the need to construct a whole new driveway. Um, and it's a, it's a paved driveway. So the driveway comes down more or less right through the middle of the woods and, and goes to these two houses that are um, on the, on the right-hand side. Um, the parcel is not rated at all on the Lands of Conservation Interest map. I'm not sure quite why. Um, the driveway for, oh, if you go back to, or look, look at it on here, you could visualize where the new house is and to the south immediately there's another house that has a kind of a horseshoe drive and one end of that horseshoe drive is going to be kind of opposite where the new driveway is but it's not quite clear um, and I would suggest that they ask the engineer to locate this existing driveway on the other one just to make sure that they're not going to be in conflict in any way. Um, and that was basically it. My, uh, I was, I, I was hoping for a little clarification on, on uh, what the viewshed easement is all about. What what is attempting to be protected, and what are the provisions of this viewshed easement? Because I see a reference to it in other places on the plan. I didn't notice anything about it back here in the area where the septic system is. But can you elaborate on that, Eric? Um. Not much more than I already mentioned. There is, and this should have been online. I'm not sure if it was. Uh, it should have been the deed that they provided. So, 
Well, what's the intent? Uh, I mean, yeah. it, what, it, is it to prevent the construction on the ridge line or is it to no. keep, uh, keep from messing up somebody's view of the lake or you know, what, what is it? That was the intent. When they originally subdivided it and um, was marketing it, I think it was to give views to the future owners of the property. So again, uh, there is like an area right along uh, here. That this is a view shed protection area so that these homes have a view looking out to the lake. Um, and you know, these guys don't build their homes there or plant trees there or whatever. Um, I believe this one has an area similar to that in this parcel, or maybe this parcel too. Maybe it's that okay, one. Okay. Um, these guys, uh, when they built their house recently, which is over in this area, um, I think that this area might have had a protection area, but they also mentioned that um, this property, <laughs> sorry, has a protection area kind of looking that direction. And so this one has one also kind of going in this way. Oh, I see. So that must have something to do with the siting of the, um, of the proposed house, that they, they were not able to put it immediately south of that other one because they were not allowed to get in the, in the view to the south from that adjacent house? Yeah, I believe so. Evidently, yeah. Oh, OK. All right. Well, that's interesting. Um, yeah. All right. So environmental concerns. Um, I, I didn't see anything terribly um, uh, worth noting about it. I mean, it, it is encroaching on the woods. And if the same thing could be accomplished, citing the house just a little bit to the west so that you wouldn't have to encroach on the woods, I think that would be more desirable, although uh, possibly that's not an option because of this woodshed, um, uh, viewshed easement. Viewshed, yeah. So, um, you know, I think that the piggybacking on somebody else's driveway is great. Um, um, and, you know, well, from the other driveway, that, those are the only uh, concerns. From the owner's own perception of how many trees are coming down, and he says 100, I, you know, those could be, I don't know what kind of trees there are there. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hardwood forest, but, uh, you know, could be shrub, could be uh, on the, you know, on the edge of that. Um, I would want to kind of enforce or kind of magnify our uh, concern that although we would prefer to see no impact on the woods and in, into that sentence that really a hundred trees seems to be a heck of a lot. That's going to, and when you looked at the site plan, that's, um, I didn't see the measurements of how many feet or anything it's going to go into that, but it looked like it was going to take whatever it's going to take all the way from what we see here on this site from the edge of that all the way back to quite a few to you know to quite a few feet so um maybe on the site plan we have it it's going to go all the way back to oh sorry um this is where the you can see the wooded area goes right into the house here, and then there's another little line going down there. Um, it's the position of the house in that area and where that driveway comes in that is the main factor for all of those trees coming down. And I just have a concern with that, being it's a small 10 acre, you know, potential habitat, and I'm sure it is a habitat. Um, whether we could not take so many trees down. And especially if we've got some hardwoods who are there that are older and larger.
Has anyone assessed the woods to see what kind of trees really are there? I don't think so. I, see. I don't well, even think, like I said, he just mentioned this, uh, that the 100 trees were coming down just as we were kind of leaving the project and something else took place and I didn't get a chance to um, actually ask, well, how many, you know, 100 trees, <laughs> what are we talking about here? Substantial trees, just smaller trees, you know, what is going on? So it would be nice to know what kind of trees and, and the age, you know, the diameter of, yeah, I think it would anyway. It doesn't seem to Why be. Why would it have to go straight back from the house anyway, you know? Well, yeah, if, if the house could be shifted to the west by, let's say, 30 feet, 40 mm -hmm. feet, something like that, that would uh, preserve the woods. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on, the other, on the other hand, looking at the, at the aerial view, I think the overwhelming likelihood is that these are fairly small trees and that this was a farmed parcel in the, you know, up until 1950 anyway, if not um, uh, oh, more recently than that. Years ago. Uh, it would be nice to know what's there, actually. Actually, you can figure that out um, in the uh, look, looking at the historical aerial views. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's one of the things available on Encore is there's, a, there's some layers that are photographs from going back to the 30s. Oh. Uh, sometimes earlier and that, that, that what was that eric what was that view that you just previously showed what is that view of from 2006. okay so that that's a pretty dense canopy from my point of view yeah um, yes yeah it's mature um so financial trees yeah yeah some there, there's pretty, some pretty good yeah So I guess the question that we that we don't know is, we know we've got a hundred trees, but we don't know what their, you know, what their value is according to their uh, their um, age mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. And if mm -hmm. they could possibly shift the house, they could so minimize that, the amount of tree removal would be exactly. what we would recommend. I'd think. And I think basically um, that would be our recommendation. Gee, what's, what's that uh, photo from? 1994. Ah. Yeah, well, see if you can find one from, from 1954. Looks like it's pretty well been woods for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So we've got some big trees there. I don't That's know where really big. But let's see, I do have one from in my office, which you guys can't see. But this one is from the 60s. It was definitely farmed then. The land was farmed. Yeah. That. That. Hmm. Yeah. This photo, the one I have in my office, is it's clearly from when Eastern Boulevard was being built in the cities in the city. So you kind of know exactly when it was built. This whole area was farmland at that point. Well. So this is about a, say, a 60, 60 year old woods. Woods. So it's not going to have enormous trees in it. Well, not um, enormous, no. but it's still woods. Yeah, it's right. still woods, and it's still you know sixty years old. And given the rate of hardwood regeneration here, that's uh, you know if if it has regenerated and there are some substantial trees, it would be good to protect them if we could. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, th I think if the owner is willing to consider shifting the house, let's make the suggestion anyway. Okay. Shift house, preserve trees. Or preserve trees, shift house. 
Yes. <laughs> uh, John, with this recommendation, do you just want to, uh, if I don't know how you how you've taken down the notes or whatever, but if you want to send it, it'll you'll send it to us anyway, so that we can just kind of look it over and and see if uh, we can put it in more succinct language. Oh sure, yeah, check it back. Yeah. Okay. John, I, I noticed a few typos in this draft I wrote, so I'll, I'll send you a revised one and I'll, I'll make the change for that recommendation too. Oh, good. Thank you. Great. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Moving right along. We're moving into old business. The ECB page uh, town newsletter for August um, wasn't about native pollinators, as it turns out. <laughs> Uh, did about face there and our uh, was about uh, invasive species. So um, because there was some rationale behind that change, um, one was uh, we had been talking about, and this is kind of goes going down one of our uh, things that we're going to talk about later uh, on this in old business was the display case. Uh, that we had been offered from the planning department and Michelle was offering it to us. And as soon as the comprehensive plan materials came out of one part of that or one half of that display case. And so that became available. And so um, uh, we decided to keep uh, kind of focusing on uh, in, in, uh, invasive species with that in the newsletter and also in our new redesigned and um, reorganized web page. So we made a consistent um, and obvious intention to uh, look at um, invasive species in August. And one of that impetus in that was that um, Edith produced a, a training video for the town's uh, highway departments on invasive species. She usually gives a, a round in March or sometime in spring, an invasive species workshop for the town uh, highway department, but couldn't do that this year in person. So she produced a, a schedule. <laughs> So we did a Zoom and we recorded a Zoom and believe me, we had some issues in the beginning, but I think we finally got a great, nice uh, thing. So the, the whole of August has been nothing but invasive species for those of us who've been involved in, you know, uh, putting out some, um, out, you know, uh, public education materials. So that's what you're going to find in the August edition if you haven't read it yet. Okay, so... Um, the September um, newsletter is actually, um, Oxa, or, uh, Sarah Linda is going to be, had signed up for that, and she's going to be doing something on the uh, blue-green algae or HABs uh, review for us. You're still into that, Sarah Linda? Yep. Okay. And then in October, we, uh, that was Kim, and that was supposed to be our dark, dark sky program. That, of course, is not happening. And um, I think last time we talked about perhaps conservation easements might be a good topic for that. So um, if you, anybody else has any um, interest in other topics, um, you can offer those suggestions now. And since Kim is not at our meeting today, I can get with her and we can talk about how she wants to go move into the September, um, new, or the October newsletter slot. Any suggestions for anything? Okay, I'll, I'll talk with her and who knows? <laughs> it may change. I have no idea at this point. Okay, so um, September through October should be determined, perhaps conservation. Okay, review of the revised web page. Eric, could you bring the new web page, the ECB web page up, please, so we can just take a look at it? Okay, so I'm hoping you have all taken a look at it and you have some, um, maybe some kinds of comments for us. Um, John and I worked on this through um, July, the end of July, the beginning of August. 
and we kind of condensed things and uh, moved all of our uh, board information over to the left hand side or the right hand side and then all of our um, educational materials over to the right. So if you just scroll down, you can just take a look at the kinds of things uh, that we've been up to. Uh, we put all of our tree, we categorized uh, different sections of this now by, di by different topics. So now we've got everything that has to do with trees is under our value, value of trees, the best practices for your backyard and protecting the lake and other issues are there. Uh, we've got the invasive species um, uh, uh, section there. And then we have a new section called webinars. So Gary has been very interested in uh, it, webinars and invasive species and um, how we could benefit, how our residents could benefit from some more in-depth, okay, training regarding our invasive species. So what he did and did very well is he um, put together a whole list of webinars. Gary, did you actually view these webinars completely, each one? I have uh, 35 hours of training. I want you to credit me for. Yeah, I'm going to. Would you please? <laughs> you now have met your 12 units, okay? He vetted it, and this is not the whole list of what we had, but this was a selected list from his uh, official offering here. Um, it, believe me, it would be double that, and I thought that might be a little bit too much, but anyway, we chose subjects that we were looking at right now as far as invasive species, the gypsy moth, uh, the woolly adelgid, um, the different kinds of, of uh, uh, you know, invasives that we, that we have, not only in plant, but also in pest. So, um, that is a new one and we keep adding those webinars. There's a webinar down there, I think at the, at the end, and it's the, uh, an inside look at the, the issues of birds in glass that Sarah Linda offered for us that she had taken and thought it was quite interesting. And it is really quite interesting. So if you see, have you at, through your trainings go to webinars that you feel might be a value to our residents regarding any of these topics or maybe one that you wanna think we don't have enough information on, please forward it to me and then we can have, we can, you know, make it determine whether um, does we have it, anything about that in our, on our page. Eric, if you could just go down a little bit more uh, as we view some of the other topics that we have. Here's our conservation for kids. We've taken everything that we have and we put that under one title. Tick and Lyme disease was all over this page. It is now all condensed. And now we have a, a topic which is called resource partners. And I think our main, one of our goals anyway, is, uh, you know, we're, we just provide education for these topics. And so we're not necessarily, of course, some of us are the professionals in the area and have more information than I will ever have about these topics. But our resource partners are those partners in the community agencies and others in the community and associations which have uh, which are the professionals that have helped us to determine and to provide information so people uh, residents can actually go to this and say oh yeah uh, let's go to the watershed association because we do so much with them and we have a lot of their materials on this page so anyway that's a resource uh, for our residents i think also Okay, um, any questions about or any suggestions for the web page? If you do, just shoot me an email or something and um, we can redo whatever it is that might be a little more easier for our, um, you know, our residents to access this information. Okay, well, we've taken care of a number of things here on our agenda. Um, I just want to thank um, Gary and Edith for all the work that they have been put it, they put in this last month doing all their individual, Edith put together the um, display case 
uh, she, she did a great job. Take a look at it the next time you go in there. It's right as you enter into the planning department and it's a whole case of invasive species with you know, photos and, and identification and control options. So it's a, it's a pretty inclusive thing. We've, we chose seven uh, species and um, it's, it, it's, it's great information. Okay, so we've done that information. Okay, code enforcement officer training. Remember way back a couple of months ago, um, we got an email from Chris Jensen that says, gee whiz, if you would have, it was, it was directed actually to the ZBA. And um, he was talking about a shoreline uh, project that had been approved by the ZBA and the planning board and some notations from us too about how that all fit into the MS program. So it dawned on me that perhaps Chris could be an ideal person to give us a program um, on MS4. And because we haven't really, even though we are named on MS4 as a responsible party for education, I don't think we actually understand how that actually works in our community. So he's offered to provide us with a training. So here's my question to all of you. Um, we could have the training during our next uh, regular meeting. Um, we could ask him to produce a training through by zooming, uh, by recording a zoom presentation, and then we could see this uh, on the, you know, on our own time. Um, what would be, or we can have another time where we could just all do a training together. What are some of your thoughts out there regarding something like this? It would be nice if we could ask questions. Was that is the main drawback of a taped presentation. Um, yes, that is very, very true. And I think we were going to have questions too, because when I was talking with Chris, I said, oh, oh boy, you're getting into territory that is, uh, you know, that I think we will have some questions. And the other thing is that he's also going to touch on the NRI, the new NRI um, project review guidelines there. Mm -hmm and see how that all ties into MS4. So it's, it's kind of bigger than just where MS4, it's, 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 it's more intense, I think. So if we set aside, how much time do you think we would, could set aside if we're gonna have it all together, if we had it at our next meeting? He's willing to do whatever time frame we have. Usually our, our meetings go from like, you know, 4.30 to 6.30. Um, would, do you think we could get, uh, I, I don't have any idea right now if how many uh, site plan well, We probably need to ask him how much I, time he needs. <laughs> I did put it that way, but he's <laughs> giving it, that back to us. If we have a half an hour, he'll give us a half an hour. If we have an hour, he'll give us an hour. If he has 40, if we have 45 minutes, he'll give us that. I said not longer than an hour, but I would hope some, you know, maybe between a half hour, 45 minutes, not knowing how many site plan applications we'll have or what other is coming up. I don't think we have a lot of other stuff coming up. We've, uh, uh, but I don't know that for sure. So um, how, about if, how about if we ask him to to tape his presentation and then um, ask the ECB members to look at it before the next meeting or before the October meeting, whatever, and um, then ask him to come to one of our meetings for questions. I mean, come to it virtually. Yeah. You know, That's so that so that we yeah. can look at it on our own time, and then we can we can write down our questions, and then we'll have an opportunity to ask the questions of him in person at one of our meetings. But we won't necessarily have to devote the full amount of time for his presentation. I can see what he says about that. That that's not an option that we talked about, but certainly that's that is an option. What do you all think about that? Would you be willing to take a look at that and then? you know, write your questions down or whatever and bring those to the meeting so that we could 
you know, engage in the materials. Sounds good. Sounds like a good idea. Yeah, I like that idea. Otherwise, having a, a separate <laughs> session. <laughs> Sometimes you have to view something a couple of times, well, at least I do, for it to really sink in so I can I ask know. some questions. Okay, so let's, I will ask him that. And um, and he said, give him the date. I said, let's try for September, but I would run it by you guys first. Are you thinking September is a good time to do this? Yeah. Our next meeting? Probably. You'll have the time. time between now and when, see, the thing of it is, I don't know exactly when he'll be able to have it to you. If he feels like he needs the full month in order to produce it, we may not have enough time before our meeting. And if that is so, then we'll just do it in the October meeting. Does that sound like, to give him some options and some flexibility, because I don't know, I know he's he's pretty busy this summer. Um, we've got a lot of, um, of uh, applications. You know, um, yeah, it's building, building permits. Yeah, going around, um, going out. Oh, that seems reasonable. Okay, so we'll say yes, optimal September for our uh, exchange. And then if it moves into October, so be it. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. The, the, the display case, we've already talked about that. And uh, thank you, Gary and Edith, once again. Training credit spreadsheet. Could you please, could you bring that up, Eric? Um, the reason why, I don't know, have any of you, it's all been updated, but we had some problems. Uh, miss, uh, it, believe me, anything that could go wrong with this update, it went wrong. <laughs> And um, so I just wanted to make sure if each of you will look at, Gary, we will update yours, but what I need from you is to just give me 12 of those, because some of those um, webinars that you viewed are actually an hour and a half. So just give me, if you will give me the ones that you feel you would like to be accredited with, um, and it turns out to 12 credits, then um, we'll put that in there the next time. Um, Pat, I don't think we have any credits from you, but let's see, we're all pretty much there. Um, no, I, I've been a slacker. Sorry. Oh, dear. Well, you know what you can do? You can go to our own web page, go can. to the webinars, <laughs> select one, two, three, and just let me know. And I will. I will. Done deal. Okay. So, uh, Justin, looks like you've only got like a 0.5. Okay. <laughs> so... You're, you're clear. Um, Edith has got, I think uh, Kim had, um, well, she's gone to two. So um, Sarah Linda, you're done. Uh, I'm done. Okay, I guess that's it. Is when everybody, anybody looks at their own listings, I hope that it was all, it's all there. If you see any errors, let me know. Okay, on to the next topic. One thing I want to um, just add here under old business is the, um, oh no, forget about it. I did something different and we already covered it. Okay. All right. New business. Well, there has been a lot of conversation in the town in the last month regarding the gypsy moth and about a program that would be uh, regarding this topic for the town, not only the residents, but also town employees and, and boards. So I'll tell you how this all began. Um, Ryan of State Chuck is on the planning board. Um, wanted to have a conversation, a town-wide conversation regarding the gypsy moth and perhaps a presentation. So it's been very hard to get a hold of Ryan to know exactly what he envisioned and how the ECB could participate. But evidently, um, he is now going to be working with, we believe, the tree board. And the tree board um, may also 
put on some kind of a training or seminar. Um, evidently, you know, obviously the ECB is going to be offering as much help uh, as we can on any kind of a, a presentation like this. Well, we have no idea what that is. Gary and Edith are on the tree board. Um, I'm just a kind of an honorary, I'll be there, you know, uh, just to see how things are going and make sure that everything that the ECB can do, we can help, but we can support the tree board. So uh, Gary's been doing an awful lot of research on the gypsy moth and the programs that the DEC, the, a program that the DEC is um, trying to put together regarding spraying. They have a biologic uh, spray that they spray on in the, in the spring. And so this is all kind of gearing towards what's gonna happen in spring with the gypsy moth. So we don't have anything immediate, but this is all in the planning stages now. And I'm sure Gary and Edith uh, will keep you advised as we move through this. We don't have a lot of particulars, but only kind of a lot of, of information flying around about what it could be. Uh, now, the DEC is in a process of collecting data. They did a, a flyover last week to kind of assess the extent of defoliation and looking for brighter green leaves indicating some trees in recovery. Uh, but they also uh, you know, talk about doing these egg mass surveys. You know, obviously, this is very widespread. It doesn't just include a town of Canandaigua. So I, you know, I think the DECs involvement is really important. Uh, you know, they're not, they're not talking about spraying at this point. Uh, they want to, you know, identify and uh, document the extent and then, you know, present plans. But they, you know, they work closely with the Forest Service, uh, which has more experience in, uh, in management of gypsy moths. Uh, this is not something that, you know, they've dealt with in New York State this extent for, for quite a while, you know, talking to them. It's, it's all, you know, new, a new experience for them. So they're on the learning curve, but they, you know, the DEC certainly is the one that has access to the experts, be it at Cornell or at the Forest Service to help, you know, help guide and put together a, a, a real appropriate plan moving forward. So I hope they, you know, and I think they will stay, stay involved uh, working, working with the town. So, more to come. That's that's about all we know now. And we know that whatever happens, the ECB can be a partner for all of that. Um, I just want to um, really close up our our um, agenda here with uh, a little update. Not an update, but but kind of something that I don't think we kind of um, finished. And it doesn't take much to finish, but I just wanted to let you know, you know, the open space implementation table that we reviewed in June and then again in July. And we talked about uh, what did we do or what are we going to do this year because we're going to have to update and we're going to have to participate in all these things, all, all of the strategies and the recommended actions that were on this, um, this open space uh, document. And uh, we talked about, you know, because we've, our agenda, our projects plan was just shot to hell. Um, what is it that we can do and can't, uh, that would coincide with and be part of this implementation table? So um, after we talked a little bit about it and then things started to come up, I just wanted to let you know what we have and are planning to do. That doesn't mean that things can't change, but just to, just to keep us on track with our responsibility for implementation of these strategies for the Open Space Master Plan, which is our big, big responsible uh, you know, document here. So um, one of the things that I wrote down before Gary even came up with this was webinars for invasives. <laughs> and is heaven's sakes, here was Gary doing all this research on webinars for invasives. So that is part, could be part of that. The MS4 training with Chris could also be a part of the strategy. We'll have to look and see exactly what strategies they are, but I believe that they're all going to be, uh, we'll find the, the strategy in here. The rain barrel workshop that we finally uh, completed 
was going to be on that. And actually the kids page, which identifies uh, a number of things of pollinators and some, some other issues, we're all probably all going to be on that. And if you think of anything else that we could, might do, whatever, that relates back to that implementation, implementation table, uh, let me know so that we can keep a list here. So at the end of the year, we can, we can update and upgrade um, because this is something that goes to the town board um, at the end of the year. Okay. Oh, what are we looking at here? Courage Land Stewardship. Oh yeah, these are the different, these are the different strategies. Yeah. Open space and actually conservation easement. Um, when we do our article on conservation easement, this is probably one of the areas that we haven't attended to too much is conservation easement. So our newsletter would be a good, um, opportunity for us to meet that response to meet that requirement fire land conservation easement or exception of conservation value okay we'll do our yeah okay we are now down to um member reports anything to report from the cic well we did didn't we we we, we talked about the nri that's going to be we and uh, that's the, the referral from the cic Anything else, Pat, about the CIC that you are thinking about? And say, or, you know, I can't even remember what we said in the CIC. I know that we're going to have a... I know um, the, big, the big one was Barb presenting to us. Yeah. And then deciding when next time we should meet kind of thing. And that's yeah. not happening month of August, correct? Yeah, right. So CIC is on hiatus for uh the month of we're august and yeah while. we're on <laughs> yeah right <laughs> everything's on pause, pause. <laughs> right okay local history team sarah linda are you on pause, we're on okay. pause yes. <laughs> yeah you are too <laughs> okay uh environmental committee well actually they're on pause too uh we have not met in july and i don't know if we're actually going to be meeting in august so uh, nothing to report there and we've already had the natural resource inventory update so there you go future can training I, uh, go ahead gary real quick sure uh we were talking about tiny homes uh one of the things about the cic we did take a break but I believe the next topic that they're going to discuss is like affordable housing or something like that. Um, so hopefully that discussion will partially take place then when the CIC next meets in September. Great. Thank you for that. Um, the other thing, uh, John, this is a, just a little something for you. On member reports, would you please add the, ta the tree board underneath as one of our, because we have two members of our board now who are on the tree board um, and we need to make that item and so that they can give us updates as appropriate. As soon as we meet again, yes. Uh, hey, are we meeting on August the 10th? Is that official or was that just a, gee, can you? That was one thrown out. I don't know that it has been confirmed. It was yeah. one of the choices. That's that's my take on it too. I did email Sarah and ask that question, but I have not heard back and tomorrow is Friday. So I don't know what'll happen there, but all right. Anybody have anything that they would love to talk about, offer anything? In the new edition of the DEC's conservation magazine, there's a really good article about oak wilt. Which yes, might I saw be that. Yeah. Excellent to include in our newsletter sometime or another. Because okay. Unfortunately, the town of Canandaigua and Middlesex feature largely in it. Oh, yeah, yeah. great. Yeah. Um, actually, I was wondering if we couldn't, and John, this is for you, if we couldn't just put the whole conservation newsletter on our webpage. Um, because some of those issues are very, very interesting. And not just about, you know, Oak Wilt and some of the other issues that we have, but there's camping and all kinds of things that our, our residents might be interested in. Do you think we could do that, John? Just a link to that? I guess we could. could Conservation easement. 
The magazine? The, yeah, uh-huh, the magazine. Not the one for kids. Well, for kids, too. If you come across, a, you know, Conservation for Kids, we could put that link in there, too. They're awfully good, uh, I think, anyway. Um, yeah, they are good. The F file. Newsletters in, in magazines, yeah. All we need is the electronic file. It's, it's, uh, oh, okay, I got it. Yeah, all you need is the link, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I'll send it to you because yeah. I just got it. I just got it emailed, so I'll send that link to you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that sounds good. Anything on another, else? On another thing, uh, remember our trash pickup project. Uh, it, it looks like somebody else is going to do it. Uh, I, I gather just as a private project. So, don't know much about it, but uh, that may happen this fall. Oh boy, that's that was kind of a interesting half a project or beginning of a project anyway. All right, is there anything else? All right, I'll move to adjourn our meeting. May I have a second, please? Yes, ma'am. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you all so much. We'll see you September the third. Any ideas for our web page? Just be sure and you know, uh, let me know what you're thinking. Give me a call or send an or you know an email or a text or whatever. And um, I think that uh, I, I'm feeling pretty good about the remake. And I thank you, John, very much for all of that. It was all your work, really. <laughs> I don't know how to do any of that stuff. Thank you. John's great. <laughs> Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye. Have a good August. Bye. You too. <laughs> See you all. Bye. See you, John. See you, See you Tuesday night. <laughs>